So good afternoon, everyone. At least it's afternoon where I am in Glasgow in the UK. My name good is Lena Gaida. Good afternoon. And I'm very, very pleased to be moderating the session on Arabic YA with the title Young Adult Literature, Fantastic Worlds and Where to Find Them. Um, so the body of Arabic YA remains relatively small. We definitely want more of it. So all the aspiring writers out there, please write more Arabic YA. But having said that, it does have a relatively long history. So going back to at least around the turn of the 20th century, and it's existed in many different forms. Um, so short stories, book series, magazines, um, standalone novels. And it's also a category that's constantly evolving, thanks in part to the people that uh, we'll be having in the panel this afternoon. And we're having more authors turning their hands to writing YA. Sometimes they come by way of writing picture books and then they move on to YA. Sometimes they start with YA. It doesn't matter where they start as long as you know they continue to write. And these books are more and more dealing with contemporary issues. Um, so the participants in this panel are three authors who first started writing for young adults in the past 10 years. In the case of at least Tarid, I know, and maybe Maria, you've been producing content for young people earlier than that, but the writing for mm -hmm. YA only happened uh, relatively. Uh, the, th the three participants are Tarid Najjar from Jordan by way of Palestine, uh, Maria Dadush from Syria, and Mr. Ahmed Salah Al Mahdi, I hope I said your name correctly, from Egypt. Uh, the way the session will be structured is that we will be starting with readings. Each author will read an excerpt from one of their works, and then I will ask one or two questions to each, and then we will move to more general questions to the panel as a whole. And then in the last bit, we will be uh, receiving questions from the audience and asking them to either individual authors or all of the authors, it depends on the question. So we're going to Great. start in the readings. We're going to start with Tarid, if that's okay. So I will do a brief introduction yeah. about you, Tarid. Uh, Tarid Najjar is a pioneer of modern children's literature in Jordan. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe you wrote your first book for children in 1978. That's true. Yes, <laughs> she is the author wow. of, yes, yes. She's the author of over 50 books for children and young adults. She has twice been awarded the Etisalat Award for Arabic children's literature and has been shortlisted three times. Her children and young adult novels have been widely celebrated by readers, um, adopted as part of the curriculum by schools across the Middle East, as well as beyond that. And they've been translated into English, Swedish, Turkish, French, and Chinese. She's also the founder of Asalwa Publishers, where you publish most of your books, and you're also publishing works by, um, by other authors. So over to you, Tarit. If you can also tell us, um, you know, the book, the excerpt is coming from and sort of its location in the story. Okay, right. Well, um, the excerpt I'm going to read to you today is from my latest novel, which is called Whose Dolly Is This? And uh, this novel was inspired by a family photo, the photo of my family in Haifa in the 1930s. And uh, in, you know, uh, the whole family was there. And uh, one that was my, my mother, when, uh, who was then uh, six or seven years old. And uh, I was fascinated by this picture. I had it for a long time. But every time I would look at it, I would see my mother who was sitting, holding her doll on the chair, oh. looking at me with piercing eyes. I think they used to put kohal in the eyes. So, I mean, that made her look even more. And uh, she was kind of begging me to write a story. This story is not a biographical story about her or about a doll or about something. This is, this is a picture of my mother. I took it from the family photo and uh, for the cover of the story. And I have to be clear, this is not a biographical story. So it's not a story about my mother's family. Um, but uh, although it's not a biographical story, it's, uh, there's a lot of true things in it, things that happened to a lot of people around that time. So um, it has both of it. The novel is about three Palestinian women, uh, the three generations of Palestinian women uh, in the diaspora, in Chicago to be exact. The grandmother and the daughter and the granddaughter. And the, the story uh, takes us and tells us what happens when they leave Palestine for safety. Uh, going away from the war to Lebanon. And uh, we get the story back in flashback and in real time. 
and it all unfolds um, to us uh, slowly about what happened to this family. Uh, I chose the chapter that uh, uh, describes the moment they left uh, Palestine or Jordan to go to Beirut for safety. And uh, in this chapter, the grandmother is talking, there's a conversation between the grandmother and the doll that miraculously came back to her. And uh, she feels as though this doll is kind of asking her why she didn't take her with her when they left the job or why she left her there. And through this explanation, we understand what happened to the family and how they felt when they had to leave Java and go to bed. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah. just to note, um, Tarid will be reading in Arabic, but for those of you who don't understand Arabic, you will find a translation of it, I think, in the chat, translation into English. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Tarid. Okay. Uh, وخاطبتها بغضب ماذا أنت صامتة تكلمي معي مثل ما كنت تتكلمين معي وأنا طفلة تذكرين عندما كنا نجلس تحت الطاولة الكبيرة في غرفة الطعام وشرشف الطاولة الكروشي بغلبنا من كل جوانب فتصبح المساحة بين الكراس مكانا آمنا خاصا بنا لا يشاركنا في أحد هل أنت غاضبة مني لأنني تركت إياك لا لا تغضب مني فلم يكن بمقدوري أن أخذ لقد تركت دكتور وذكرت أيضا كنت ما أغلى ما أملك تذكرين أصوات ولقات الرصاص في المدينة والانفجارات المتتالية كنت أحضنك وأشد عليك بكل ما أتيت من قوة تذكرين الشعور المستمر بالرعب ونحن نسمع عن أعداد الذين قتلوا والذين طردوا من بيوت كنت صغيرة وقتها لا ما حصل من طبعة في ذاكرتي كيف نجا أبي من رصاصة مرة وطرد من رأسه كيف أصرت أمي عندما حان وقت الرحيل على أن تسقر نباتا وتغطي الأكلات حتى الحيل من الغبار كيف أسرعت أمي تملأ حفيرة واحدة بما نحتاج إليه من ملابس ووالدي يصر على أن حقيبة واحدة فقط يسمح بها على القارب إلى بيروت كيف ضربت أمي كفا بكف وقالت أربعة أولاد وأنا وأنت بحقيبة واحدة أعقب هذا رد والدي سنشتري كل ما نحتاج إليه في بيروت لا تقلق فأنت عين وفتح عين ونكون رجعنا على يافا أصلا بيتنا هون وشغلي هون وكل حياتنا هون فكيف لأنني لم أستطع أن أخذك معي ولا أن أمي رفضت أن تأخذ فستان العيد القبة الدمتيل الذي لبسته عندما جاء مصور إلى بيتنا كان البحر يعج جموع الناس التي تبحث عن طريق الخلاص من جحيم الحرب والعدوان حيث كانت قوات الهجنة والبلماح تلاحظهم وتطلق عليهم الرصاص لتحطهم على المغادرة وعدم العودة فيصاب من يصاب ويتسلق قوارب الصيد الناجون غير مكترفين بحمولة القارب المفترض فالخيارات أصبحت محدودة إما البقاء والموت برصاص العصابات السفلمية أو ركوب القوارب ومواجهة خطر البرق في البحر ولأن والدي كان تاجرا مرموقا في يافا وله العديد من المعارف والاتصالات وقد تمكن من حجز قارب تجاري مع رئيس ماهر في الميناء واستطعنا أن نركب القارب مع آخرين بهدوء ونظام بعيدا عن جموع الناس الفاربة بجلدها في الميناء ربط والدي فردتي حذائه برباط سمى ووضعهما حول رقبته ثم ساعد أمي لتركب القارب وصار يحملنا واحدا واحدا ويمشي في الماء الذي كان يتجاوز رقبتيه ليصل إلى القارب الراسي على بعض عدة أمتار من الشرق وتستلمنا أمي منه وأخيرا حمل الحقيبة على كتفه عالية وأعطها للريس وتسلق القارب ليجلس قرب أمي شاركت الشمس على الغروب فرسمت لوحة رائعة من شتقات اللون الأحمر في الأفق البعيد غير آفهة بمأساتها وبتشلدها 
جلسنا في القالب نستمع إلى لقمات الأمواج على جانبنا وهم حمامت مثلا في القوارب من حولنا لا حاجة للكلام لأنه لا يوجد ما يقال كنا على شبيل مستقبل مجهول لم نفهم تماما ما الذي يحصل لنا ولماذا علينا أن نترك بيتنا وكل ما هو مألوف لنا شخص عيوننا نحو الأصب الممتد إلى ما لا نهاية خوفا وألما وبالقليل والقليل من الأمان Thank you so much, Tarid. That's a very moving passage from the book. I want to ask you, because at the beginning, you made reference to the fact that um, this is not a biographical, uh, it's not a biographical novel. It's inspired by the experiences of a lot of people who had to leave Palestine in 1948. And I know another of your books is sort of inspired by a real person, but the events I imagine are completely imaginary. So when you're writing books of this sort, Um, what sort of process do you follow? Do you, um, in order to keep the sort of balance or this border between, you know, reality and fiction? Um, uh, I think the, uh, the idea of the book or the, or the story is like a seed uh, that makes me build the whole story around it. So the book, the other book that you mentioned, which is Sit al uh, it was inspired also by a real person. Um, her name is Madeleine Kallab, and she is a fisherwoman, the only fisherwoman in, in Gaza. Uh, I uh, listened to an, a recording on BBC, I think it was on BBC, about uh, Madeleine, and uh, I thought this would be a great story. But I didn't want to write her actual story. I wanted the freedom to be able to change the facts as much as I wanted. And that's how I used uh, her story to write about a lot of things uh, about Gaza and about what was happening there and how um, the young people in Gaza were reacting to all of this. So this is the process that just, uh, um, you know, helps me to build a story around it. Uh, but I don't really have to be very factual about everything. I'm factual about the background, about the historical facts, but not about the personal things that are going on. Thank you very much, Tarid, for the reading and for the answer. Um, so now we're going to move over to Maria Dadush. I will do a, a brief introduction. Maria Dadush is a Syrian author and screenwriter. Early in her writing career, she wrote for the famous TV comedy series Maraya and helped to establish Pulla magazine, where she wrote hundreds of stories. She studied creative writing at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she was granted the Claire Carmichael Scholarship and won the Non-Traditional Student Story Contest. So now she focuses all her effort on writing for children and young adults, and in the past few years has written around 50 books. Uh, her YA novels have won a number of awards. This includes the, uh, the Qatara Prize for the Planet of the Uncertainties in 2018, the Abdul Hamid Schumann Prize for I Want Golden Eyes in 2019, and I believe that was uh, recently published in Arabic. And in two 2020, she won the Khalifa Educational Award for The Heart is Right Behind the Ribs. Uh, she has also instructed on a massive open online uh, course, what's known as the MOOC, And the, type, the topic was on how to write a picture book. And it was attended or accessed by more than 40,000 learners. In her endeavor to empower Arabic, Dadush has been given writing workshops and takes pride in having helped create 26 debut books written by 25 women authors. So over to you, Maria. Tell us what you'll be reading. You're on mute. Okay. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Sorry for this. Uh, so thank you, Susan, for the brief bio. Today I will be reading from the science, from my science fiction novel, I Want Golden Eyes. The story takes place at the end of the century in Al Comoros Islands, an Arab country not many of us ever heard of. Uh, like in most of science fiction literature, my novel is another harbinger of the dreadful effects of placing the excessive um, power of science in the wrong hands. Oh. 
more. Okay. And so had a high IQ. Well, the less fortunate we answered K. But um, it was the part where Magnus. Uh, I'll, today I'll be reading from the part where my protagonist, Diala, along with her father and sister, are heading to the gigantic elevator that will take them up to the surface to court, yet where they work at Professor Adams' house. Um, oh, I, I forgot to mention that the limited are denied the right to read. And uh, where we're reading today, Diala is trying to go past the checkpoint with a stolen book. Mm -hmm. So I will read now. Thank you. Okay, um, the Griffin guards were crones. Scientists had given them a human brain and winged arms that ended in claws. Many of them carried a whip and would use it when, whenever necessary or even when not necessary. Their faces were nasty folds of raw skin. They might have a nose, a mouth, eyes or ears, but my eyes could never make any of that. It was our turn to be scanned, and I felt my guts twist. I had smuggled hundreds of books, but I still couldn't get over the fear I felt every time I went through the checkpoint. They ran the device over Baba's forehead, then Dima's, and then it was my turn. I stood inside the purple circle, and the laser ray passed over my forehead, and our foreheads on the day we were born, the government implanted a chip that carried all our information, our names, the names of our parents, and of course, our intelligence score. Then the gleaming red curtain that had been blocking my path rose up and the way to the elevators was clear. I resisted the urge, the urge to touch the book hidden in the waistband of my pants as I passed the last Griffin guard near the elevator. I repeated to myself, the pages of the book won't move and the sonar won't see it as I tried to ignore the icy fear that had crept into my fingertips. I mustered a confidence that I did not really feel taking sure steps as I moved past them until I reached the closed elevator door where Baba and Dima were waiting for me along with hundreds of other limited. Today, like other days, the bat didn't suspect a thing. Today, like other days, I succeeded in smelling the book and tomorrow would be another day. The elevator finally got there and the disembodied artificial intelligence voice said, the elevator has arrived, please proceed in an orderly fashion. The doors will close in 10, nine, eight. Oh, these machines, artificial in intelligence voices really got on my nerves. I stepped into the elevator with Dima and Baba in a wave of people before our aerogel chamber glided onto the powerful nanorod that would take us up. If a media parachute ever flew close to my face and asked about the happiest moments of my life, I wouldn't have to give it even one second's thoughts. I would look at the parachute camera and give a big smile and I'd say without missing a beat, those 38 seconds that I spent on the elevator every morning on my way to Quartzia. I had a strange habit when I rode the elevator each morning. I looked towards the spot of light in the glass dome up top, pierced it through by the rod. And as the elevator capsule got closer and closer to it, I would imagine that this was my last trip on the elevator and that the rest of my life would be up above there in Quartzia. When would that come true? So I finished reading. Ironically, that Diala's wish that they came true, but unfortunately, that proved to be the worst thing that ever happened to her. So if you want to find out what happens, you have to read the translated version of the book. 
Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, the University of Austin now is translating this novel. And uh, thank you to Marcia Ailing. She's uh, doing great job translating. Wonderful. Do you have any idea when the book will be out for our audience? I think it's um, by the end of the year, I hope. Perfect, perfect, Shana, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Maria, I want to ask you, um, we know that when somebody's writing speculative fiction, a very important part of writing the book is coming up with the world and with all the yeah. rules. Um, yeah. So in the case of this book, how did that happen? Especially since you are basing it not on an imaginary place, but a place that exists in reality. What was the process you went through? Uh, yeah, um, well, um, writing uh, from the Arab world can be really challenging, especially if you're writing a science fiction story. So um, I try uh, hard to, uh, you know, uh, depict uh, Arabic details. Ge first, geographically, I had to like uh, describe the the, vol the Karthala volcano. Um, even I named my protagonist uh, Diala. Karthala Diala is an Arabic mm -hmm. name, an old tribe name, and Karthala is the name of the volcano. Um, I used um, famous poets' verses, like uh, for Nizar Abani, um, uh, I know I can't remember the verse well now, but you know it's a famous one about a world. And uh, even when I talked about the singers, I used Fairuz and Sabah Al Fakhri, the names of Arabic songs. Uh, even when they cursed, they used Arabic curses like or something like that. Uh, the romantic relationship that um, allied um, Diala with Raji who played Daoud, by the way, an Arabic instrument, uh, was the shy kind, you know, to comply with the ment Arab mentality and Arab customs when dealing for this. So, um, yes, I tried to uh, localize, if, uh, mm -hmm. if I can say, uh, the, my science fiction story, but it was challenging because, you know, uh, a science fiction in the outer world isn't really, you, know, you, need, you need to work hard to convince the reader that this is really happening in El Comoros and uh, yeah, at, at the end of this uh, century. Okay. Thank you very much, Maria. So we're going to move to our third uh, participant. Ahmed Salah Al Mahdi is an Egyptian author, translator, and literary critic who specializes in fantasy, science fiction, and children's literature. He also writes for children's magazines. His two novels that have been translated to English are the YA novel Reem and the science fiction thriller Malaz. Is that correct? Uh, yes. He's also published a picture book. <laughs> <laughs> so Ahmed, uh, if you could just tell us which book you're reading from and a general idea about the book. Uh, the novel is uh, Reem and it is unknown. Uh, and the subtitle was added only in the English translation mm. because in Arabic, uh, the reader would ask to state what is Reem, it's a girl name, so what's the story? Okay. But in English, I felt that it won't uh, have the same weight, so I added it's unknown, and it's, it's actually a, a name of the chapter in the, mm. in the novel, Fi Ghumar al Maghul. And I found this subtitle um, tell exactly what this novel is about. Uh, a lot of unknowns in, <laughs> in the story. So it's about Saif, uh, a young man, uh, normal, uh, normal man, live normal life. So one day he decides to uh, buy a pet. So he found this black cat. Uh, the seller told him that no one wants to buy a black cat. He said, oh, he's lonely like me. So I will buy him. And it turned out to be the worst decision <laughs> of his life. <laughs> so he got tangled into this dark world that no one knows about like witchcraft and magic. And actually, the true protagonist of the story is Reem, the young girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She lives with his grandmother because his parents died in a car accident. Mm -hmm. So she lives with her, but she tries to uh, understand what's happening. Her grandmother is here for some time, and there is some mystery around here. So she, she discovers that his grandmother is, uh, her grandmother is uh, 
a witch, <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. surprise. <laughs> so um, uh, when Saif found dream, uh, she already knew that her grandmother is a witch and she tried to escape and her mm -hmm. grandmother uh, uh, got her back and uh, imprisoned her in the house with this black cat as a watcher or mm -hmm. some kind. Mm -hmm. And she tried to get rid of the black cat and then Saif caught the cat and he Return with the cat to the witch hut, and uh, the story is a complete circle. So the part I'm about to read uh, is when Reem discovered that his grandmother is a witch, and she uh, thinking about escaping. Then she tried to learn what uh, is this magic about. Okay, so I will read in Arabic, and uh, here we go. مرة الأيام على ريم كئيبة ولم تعد تتكلم أو تفعل شيئا سوى الجلوس والصمت أخذت تفكر في الهرب ولكن كيف وأين تذهب ثم قالت لنفسها أنها إن أرادت الهرب فيجب عليها أولا تخلص من القط الأسود وأصابت هذه الفكرة بالحباس والدافع لفعل شيء بدلا من الجلوس والاكتئاب كان هناك مكتبة خشبية في رضهة البيت وتبدو الكتب مرصوصة بنظام داخلها متناقضة مع البيت الذي تطوله يد الإهمال ولم تقترب ريم من تلك الكتب من قبل ولكنها فكرت في أن تلقي عليها نظرة بينما جدتها بالخلف لم يبدو للقط أن ما تفعله غريبا فتساءب وهو يمط قائمتيه الأماميتين واستلقى أمامها بينما جلست هي على الأرض وهي تحمل أحد المجلدات القديمة جذبته من المكتبة الخشبية وقد اصفر ورقه من أثر برور الزمن عليه كانت الأوراق مليئة بالرموز الغريبة والرسومات التي لم تفهم معناها وبعد ذلك أدركت أن هذه الكتب تخص السحر والوصفات السحرية وأشياء أخرى غريبة لم يعد لديها شك أن جدتها ساحرة كما أخبرتها أثار ما قرأته شغفها وزاد من خوفها من جدتها في الوقت ذاته فهي تنتمي لعالم غريب عنها وتمنت لو تقدر أن تستعيد حياتها القديمة الطبيعية مع والديها ولكن هذا بدأ حلما بعيد البلد مقضة الأيام التالية هو ريم مستغرقة بين هذه الكتب يحركها الفضول والشغف والرغبة في التعلم وأحيانا كانت تخبئ كتابا في غرفتها دون أن تشعر جدتها كي تقرأه مساء وقد أغلقت على نفسها باب غرفتها أصحاب أصبحت ريم مسحورة بهذا العالم الغريب عنها وانتابتها مشاعر مختلفة ومضطربة ما بين الانبهار والخوف وهكذا مرت عليها الأيام وهي مستغرقة في تلك الفنون الغريبة حتى جاء يوما من الأيام ريم شيئا آخر أثر حماسها وقد عثرت على كتاب وجدت جدتها تخبئه في درج سري في مكتبتها اكتشفت فيه ريم بالصدفة وهي تفتش بين الكتب كان قديم كان كتابا قديما وقد ارتسمت عليها صورة قط أسود قديم بنجمة مخيفة أثار الغلاف فوقها وفضولها في الوقت ذاته وتمنت أن يكون للكتاب علاقة بالقط الأسود وهكذا خبأت الكتاب أسفل سريرها حتى المساء وعندما أحست أن جدتها قد بطت في النوم أخرجت الكتاب من أسفل سيرها وأشعل الشمع لتستطيع رؤية الكلمات وانهمكت بقراءة الكتاب وهي تلتهم بروح كان الكتاب يتعلق بالخادم الذي تستنيه الساحرة والذي عادة ما يكون قطعا أسود وأنواع السحر وتعويذ المختلفة التي يمكن ورثتها عنه فهم تريم أخيرا السحر التي مارسته لفتنها على القطع الأسود وهو نوع من التعويذ يسمى سحر الكتابة ومن خلاله تستطيع الساحرة أن تجعل القط الأسود يراقب شخصا ما ولا يتخلى عن مراقبته أبدا. أخذت ريم تبحث بحماسا عن الحل للتخلص من هذا السحر، وعرفت أن الحل الوحيد للتخلص منه هو أن يقوم شخص ما باقتناء هذا القط بالإرادة. بس. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ahmed. That's very fascinating. I hope that will encourage people to either read it in Arabic or English. And uh, the English translation is available. You can buy it on wherever you buy books, so as not to promote one online market <laughs> place. Uh, Ahmed, what I find very fascinating when I was doing my thesis, I did an experiment. So I would go and talk to, during book fairs, I would talk to booksellers and I would ask them, when young people come up to you to ask about certain books, which books are they really interested in? And sometimes they wouldn't take a second to think, they would think horror, horror. And it's not just, you know, Egyptian young people, it's people in the Gulf all over the Arab region. And I always wondered, why do you think that is? And maybe starting with you yourself as a horror fan, what is it that attracts you to horror? Uh, when I was a very young, um, 
It's an Elta fable in uh, my town, I mean, based on Upper Egypt. Tell a story about jinn and ghosts and supernatural and Tiarna, just a story. They are telling us facts from their perspective. So it's very interesting to find that uh, jinn can take a shape in, your, in real life and do something and harm someone. So for people, this is not just a fiction. It's uh, part of our life. So um, me, when I was young, I was about five or six years old, and a lot of the, my uh, family, kids, and other kids in the neighborhood would uh, gather around one of the elder people, and she was well, and, uh, an elder woman, uh, and uh, listen to stories about Jen uh, and uh, other horrors. And it was very fascinating. Uh, and uh, I, I felt terrified, but excited at the same time. I liked this and I, will, I always come to uh, listen to more. <laughs> so uh, it's something in our niche, I guess we love uh, the supernatural. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandmother used to tell me a uh, folk tale, not exactly horror, some of uh, magic and, uh, and heroes and uh, Shatter Hassan, Sith Hassan mm -hmm. Gamal, uh, something like that. She once told me about the story of a young lady who was kidnapped by a ghoul, and she has a long hair that she, he can use to climb up it. Uh, when I grow up and find Tangled or Rapunzel, I was, <laughs> how my grandmother know about that? <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, the, the fairy tales and folk tales from all around, around the world is connected. I found that when I read, uh, I have a collection of fairy tales from all around the world, Europe and Asia and Africa. And mm -hmm. I found uh, uh, very, very similar stories, a lot of similar stories from all around the world. Um, and that is why I tried to do in Rim. Rim uh, uh, has some elements of the Egyptian folk tales and some of the Arabian uh, uh, folk tales elements like the witch in the hut and the black cat and so on. And also in Egypt, uh, the black cat is considered something of the, it's a jinn or, mm -hmm something super natural. So I made this connection in Rim. It's not exactly uh, Egyptian folk tale, but uh, for Western folk tale, it's a mix. <laughs> OK. Thank you so much, Ahmed. So now that we've done all the readings, I'm going to ask some questions to all the members of the panel. And this, was, this question was inspired by something Tarit told me when I interviewed her for my thesis where you said that writing is two things. On the one hand, it's the thing that the writer themselves care about or are interested in or are worried about. But on the other, you're aware of your reader as a young person and you're trying to give them something, either something they need or something they want. So I want to ask each of our authors, when you write, which is the part that comes from you, your own interests, and which is the part where you're trying to meet the needs of young people? So if we could start with um, just maybe the same order, Tarid, Maria, and then Ahmed, if possible. Oh. You're on mute, Tarid. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I think uh, that it's very important that when a writer writes, is, uh, they, they write uh, about a subject that they are fascinated with, or that's uh, something in their mind. And I found out that uh, this is what I do all the time that uh, there is an idea that I want to get across that I feel emotional about. But then when I start uh, to write it, then I have to think about my audience and uh, not just about my, my uh, getting the catharsis, getting out what I feel. <laughs> so uh, I include a lot of things in the novel that relates to them. And that makes them feel that this is about uh, their interests too, not just my interests. And I think uh, when you feel strongly about something, you come across as genuine to the reader and the reader feels that and reacts with that. So that's my experience of it. Thank you. Uh, Maria? You're on mute. Sorry. So um, only uh, one of my five, uh, five novels where um, like I chose to write what I wanted to write about. 
but uh, the rest were uh, were triggered um, or by dictated by either a word or by uh, pub publishers who contracted me to write about drugs or something. Uh, but I was lucky it coincided that the topics I wrote about were interesting to young readers, to young people, I mean. Um, in fact, they were most curious about, the, uh, I wrote about the drugs, uh, schizophrenia, social injustices, even more. But uh, on another note, I believe that if I'm a good, if I'm a good writer, I can write, uh, if I'm assigned uh, a subject, whether appealing to young people or not, I can still manage, if I'm a good writer, to get their attention and applause by honestly depicting my young characters' human experiences because the human experiences are universal, right? Uh, so this is, you know, my two cents. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and do you sometimes find that sometimes when you are given some constraints, they can actually help you to be a bit creative? Oh, uh, well, it's, you, you know, limits are always bad. Okay. It's always good, yeah. It's always good to feel free to write whatever, you know, to feel like writing about. Okay. Um, Ahmed? Uh, okay, I want to admit that I write for myself first. <laughs> I write what I will, I think I will enjoy to read. Um, I used to read a lot when I was young. I know what I, I really loved back there when I was five, six, seven, eight mm -hmm. years old. Uh, so when I write something now, I ask myself, would I really enjoy it if I read it back then? Um, and till this day, I enjoy reading uh, the books that is written for king, kids and young adults. I really like uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland and uh, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> this uh, novel, uh, till this day, I really love it. So when I, I have an idea and I want to write it, I ask myself first, will you enjoy reading it? So mm -hmm. I think if I enjoy it, I hope the reader, uh, <laughs> the young adults will enjoy it too. So, so you're writing, um, sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, if I'm allowed to add yes, something, uh, yeah, uh, young, it's always, it's young adult literature, literature is only YA literature, if it does appeal to age eight to 88. Okay. So what, he's, what <laughs> I'm saying uh, is true. Is... Yeah, uh, you know, um, I've seen very old people in the parks reading the last sequel of Harry Potter, 80 years old, baby. And I've seen very young readers, like eight years old or, or seven years old, enjoying that book. So I think, yeah, what what's Ahmed is saying is very true. Okay. I wanted to ask you something else, which is, uh, like we said, there isn't, like we have a long history of Arabic YA, but there hasn't been a lot of it. So what I'm really interested in is that in forming you individually as authors, what were the experiences that formed you? Maybe it was books you enjoyed reading, or maybe it was particular training workshops that you attended, that you felt uh, is forming you, and that as you go along, you're developing more and more in, as writers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we can start with, uh, with any one of you, whoever wants to. Uh. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll choose then, no problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so maybe if we can start with you, Maria. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, allow, allow me to start with the, the, the influence of my personal experiences. I'm Syrian. I lived most of my life in Syria. Uh, I'm a first-hand witness of the war. Mm -hmm. um, and this did have a direct influence on at least one of my novels, The mm -hmm. Planet of Absur Absurdities. Mm -hmm. um, I think the contest played a major role in, in why this particular novel was rewarded the Katara Award. Mm -hmm. uh, my protagonist, Naya, uh, suffered from uh, PTSD uh, because she witnessed the death of both of her parents during a, a bombing or a shelling in Aleppo. And uh, in my novel, I tried to depict the the Syrian mechanisms of coping with war conditions. Mm -hmm. 
Um, on the other hand, I had a very pleasant, happy, vibrant childhood. So uh, this is why my books for younger age are very humorous and funny. Yeah. So um, yes, personal uh, experiences do affect, have their effects on our books. As for what really uh, authors or books did uh, have influence on me, my favorite author is Cormac McCarthy and his favorite book is The Road. Um, also, I, I love uh, the Ties by uh, Domenico Starnone. It's a, a very famous and great Italian author and this book was translated by the Pulitzer winner Lumpa Lahiri uh, mm -hmm. to English. Yeah, and I think it was uh, even translated to Arabic and called uh, uh, Arbita or Silat or something. Yeah, uh, um, Arabic authors that had influence on me or had influence on me, Huda Barakat mm -hmm. with her book, uh, Booker Award uh, winner, um, very delay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we can see that it's sort of literary influences of all sorts, whether they're for children or for adults, as well as personal yeah. experiences. Yeah. Of course, along with my instructors at the university, mm -hmm. yeah, I was very, very lucky to have the greatest instructors ever. Yeah. So they, I should be thankful for them forever. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Robert Eversers, yeah, and Adam Prince, and Beth, yeah, and Beth Baumann, yeah. Thank you. Um, so if we can hear from Tagrid. Well, um, kind of old fashioned, I think. <laughs> the, the books that really affected me as a child uh, were the classics, I think. Mm -hmm. Emmett Blyton, The Fives, uh, Secret Seven, and before that, uh, when we were kids, we used to read the unabridged uh, Charles Dickens books. I don't know how we managed to understand them. They were the Thick and we, we, could we did, yeah. and, and understand them. And I think uh, all these stories really had a, a very, very uh, good effect uh, on me and wanted me to, to write. They were exciting. And uh, uh, I wanted to write about uh, books that were similar and gave as much pleasure to kids as I, <clears throat> I got from them, reading them. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, uh, reading was uh, what made me want to write. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as you know, I started writing a picture book and uh, later on moved to uh, the young adult books. So it took me a while to progress to the young adult uh, genre. Okay, um, Ahmed? Uh, okay, when I was very young, I used to read the. Uh, uh, it's a box of a series called Al Maktab Al Khadra. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the, the, it, <laughs> it was uh, grew up reading those very ones. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everyone knows. Yeah. Uh, it was fascinating. Uh, um, what drives me, uh, what drove me to read was my grandmother fairy tale. So I looked for more and I found them in Al Maktab Al Khadra. Mm -hmm. Then I uh, came uh, across the series of. Um, uh, the Riwayat Masrili gave Egyptian novels, uh, pocket novels, uh, very short novels or novellas. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the books of Dr. Nabil Farooq and uh, Ahmed Khalid Tawfiq. Ahmed Tawfiq, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, affected me a lot. Uh, I like the uh, science fiction and espionage novels of Dr. Nabil Farooq. I like mm -hmm. I liked the uh, horror and supernatural elements uh, with Dr. Ahmed Khalid Tawfiq. Mm -hmm. And they both were the gate for an the, uh, an, the older authors like Dr. Nabil Farouk was my gate to Joel Verne and H.G. Wells and uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Ahmed Khan Tawfi was uh, the gate to Lovecraft and Edgar mm -hmm. Allan. Um, and I began, I actually began writing when I was 13 years old. <laughs> I was inspired by Dr. Nabil Farouk. I wrote a story about uh, um, an Egyptian scientist who created something and uh, CIA wanted to assassinate him <laughs> and he actually did it. And there was car chasing and uh, bullets and so. Uh, my second attempt, uh, attempt at uh, writing a novel, I was, the next year I was 14 years old. 
and mm -hmm. I was inspired by Harry Potter and George Fellings. I wrote mm -hmm. a story about a society of uh, uh, wizards uh, mm -hmm. uh, living uh, in a hideout from society like in Harry Potter, but I created my own world and I own my own map like mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Middle Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, from there, I began writing and exploring and trying uh, a lot of new ideas. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, Malaise that was published in uh, 2017, uh, the idea came to me um, uh, when I was in high school, uh, 26, 27, something like that. And I, keep, I kept editing and changing the idea until I uh, came to the idea of Malaise City of Resurrection. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the Egyptian book novels was the, the biggest factor in, in my life as a leader and as a writer. Okay, um, there's a question from the audience, which is, can we think now of something that's the equivalent of those pocket novels? Or maybe like the Maktab al-Khadza, which we read. If there is a publisher who can uh, bring people uh, together, bring together this uh, this great uh, mm -hmm. children and YA authors, we can we want to make something like Al Maktab Al Khadra. I hope we can make something that like that someday. And I have three ideas. Okay. okay perfect. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking forward to that, Ahmed. You're already. <laughs> <laughs> you already started. <laughs> Um, we have some questions. I do. I, I do. A bit, yeah, mm, yes, I, I think I a bit. Uh, yeah, I disagree or have another opinion. I think Maktab al Khadra, I, I, from my perspective, think it's outdated now. I'm not sure mm. if children will be uh, as impressed to read them as we used to. Mm -hmm. I think uh, today's children are more into uh, like a horror tension. Uh, uh, Harry Potter and Percy mm. Jackson, yeah, all mm. these fast paced, uh, realistic mm -hmm. fiction. I think mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, if, if uh, the, 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 the person or the audience, the one who asked about this uh, similar series, I don't think we have a, a, as widespread series as they used to, but we do have uh, uh, Tagrid has a series. Uh, a whole uh, early reader series called uh, Dahdun. Um, and also uh, I have a series for, for age nine called Tayyip mm -hmm. Sami and a mm -hmm. younger age eight called Karma Karamilla. Yeah, but I can't remember, think of other series. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a question to both Tarid and Maria because some of your books, you deal with quite difficult topics. So things like war, displacement, PTSD, um, drug addiction. So um, how do you feel, what do you feel is the best way to handle such sensitive topics? So if we could start with Maria and then move to Tagrid. Uh, well, that's a tough one. Yeah, I do lots of these searches, mm -hmm. like for months and months, and I keep interviewing people and experts and teenagers who experience uh, this kind of uh, traumas or, or what were the topic we're talking about. And this is how we get to learn where the sensitive areas are and try to approach delicately, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so research. And like you said, yeah, going research. about it very carefully. Yep. Yes. Yes, David. Yeah. Um... Like Maria, I, have, I do a lot of research, and uh, some of the research I, I do it when I'm writing a novel about certain things. But the novel, I, the uh, subjects that I choose are kind of, uh, I was a little bit worried whether teenagers would be interested in what I'm writing, uh, especially because there's this political element and there's no, you know, about what's happening. But a lot of them, 
these stories are not just about Palestine, they're about a lot of displacement that happens in the Arab world and a lot of problems that are similar that uh, people will re relate to when they read uh, these books. And I found out that uh, they were very much needed in, uh, by in the YA. They were serious and, uh, you know, when you uh, address uh, teenagers with respect and with uh, knowledge, they uh, react accordingly. And mm -hmm. a lot of the information there uh, makes them understand what's going on around them because you can't escape that. You can't really uh, protect them from uh, what is going on. Some of them, it's their family history too that is being uh, related mm -hmm. to these uh, stories. So, uh, and the way to do it is to do it uh, really uh, actually and at the same time through a human interest story. So it's not just information or just trying to yeah. hide them up, but just telling them a story about real people and what's happening to them. So that's how I do it. Okay. Um, this brings us to uh, something both Maria and Tarid raised earlier, where we're talking about young Arab readers and what they want. And in your opinion, what is it they want from the literature that, you know, that addresses them? Who do you want to ask? Uh, maybe start with Ahmed this time. This yeah. <laughs> About time. <laughs> uh. Okay, I think um, uh, a lot of the ideas today um, uh, in the in the day of internet, uh, children nowadays know a lot of things that uh, they don't need books for, to learn them. They already know a lot of things about the world around them. So uh, trying to think about a new idea for a book is, is challenging nowadays. We want to impress uh, uh, the young reader. So I think we you need to keep uh, a step ahead of the the the, the trends. Uh, you don't want to chase trends. You need to, mm -hmm. to, to take a step ahead of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, like Maria said, I think I don't think the folk tale holds the same uh, weight as it was for us when twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. But I think they st still hold some magic. Uh, I experimented with translating a lot of short stories. I published them on my page on Facebook. And I found a lot of young readers and parents who told me that we read this short stories that you translate to, to our, uh, our young, uh, uh, younger uh, kids. So I think we can do a mix of bringing the old idea. We can mm -hmm. reimagine them. We can, uh, Reimagine that. Yeah, it's a story of Red Riding Hood, but if uh, Red Riding Hood is not uh, in the old day, it's it's in the current age. What what would it be like to have a stranger following you and you are going to, uh, to your grandmother's house in the day of the internet? Would you use your cell phone or the internet? So um, the 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 next thing I would like to do is uh, creating the rewards. Uh, like in fantasy or science fiction, you can mm -hmm. build a new society on a new planet. It, you mm -hmm. can present uh, new ideas to, to the reader. So um, either we uh, create a new world or take an, an old one and reimagine. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm in addition to the Arab young reader because a lot of you either have been translated or they will have translated editions of their works coming out soon. What is it you would like? for readers beyond the Arab region to get from your books? I mean, keeping in mind, maybe some of those who will read in English will be people of Arab heritage as well. So this is also addressed to all three authors. What would you like those reading in English to get from your books? I, I can start, I can, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if my work should be translated to other societies, I'd like others to realize that uh, um, all universal feelings and human experiences do apply to Arabs like they do to other societies. I believe that if I'm a good writer, I can portray our local stories and still manage to get other societies applause by honestly depicting my characters' human experiences because human experiences are the same. The media always portray Arabs unfairly and I would want 
other societies to see us for who we really are, our dark sides, our brighter ones, our fears and dreams and plans and worries and struggles. Um, I think uh, knowing others uh, bridge the gaps between societies. And this is what I want, uh, why I want my own work to be translated mm -hmm. and what I want from other audiences. Thank you, Maria. So we'll hear from Tari, but then finish up with Ahmed. Okay. Yep, I agree totally with Maria. When I, if our books are translated or when they're translated, we are, uh, I hope that the other culture that's reading them will understand more about us and accept, just like we did. We read a lot of uh, foreign literature as we were uh, kids. We know all about the culture. We know. And we feel that uh, uh, it's great to know uh, little things about mm -hmm. uh, these people and how they react and, and what they think and all that. And in the uh, literature that I write, I mean, the, the stories that are written which are uh, about uh, certain political things that are happening. Uh, yeah. As Marie says, we've been very misunderstood and the story is not out there. And uh, I always feel that if our story is out there in other languages, it will really, uh, for the new generation, they will understand what we're going through. They'll see that uh, human beings with, uh, with the same aspirations and the same fears and going through different experiences. You have the Bayal Raz. You're Ahmed this time. <laughs> As uh, some sound effects for the atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, we're talking about culture and uh, so. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Here comes the answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, After read, did you have anything else to say? Sorry. <laughs> That's mostly it. No, I just was wondering about uh, the story of Anne France. Take that mm -hmm. for an example of the diaries of Anne France. Mm -hmm. Millions and millions of copies were uh, published yep. uh, all over, and her story yep. and what happened uh, in the Holocaust mm -hmm. uh, is read by school children mm -hmm. uh, everywhere. So, I mean, our story, I would like that also to get through so that uh, people read and understand um, what is going through, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tarid. And finally, Ahmed, what is it that uh, you would like? <laughs> people to get, non-Arab people or non-Arab readers to get from your books? Uh, okay, literature is a bridge between uh, different cultures. Um, I hope to break some boundaries. Uh, a lot of people don't know much about uh, Egypt or other than the pyramids and the, <laughs> some, <laughs> the famous uh, monuments. Uh, but there is a lot to the, the Egyptian culture and uh, I, like to present it in the stories. My novel Malaz uh, is set in the far future, but uh, it holds a lot of the elements of the, uh, the Egyptian spirit, uh, if I may mm -hmm. say. And even the, um, I presented the, the ancient Egyptian religion in the future. So mm -hmm. I want to, to give more information about it. I, I researched it and even used some words and mentioned their meaning. Uh, so even for the Arabic reader, if you read the story, he mm -hmm. will learn that the word Seya, the name of one of the characters in the story, means knowledge, okay? So mm -hmm. the, the non-Arabic reader also will learn something about that. There is a lot of gods that Egyptian worship in the ancient days, so I mentioned some of them and the, their place in the pantheon of gods mm -hmm. in the ancient mm -hmm. Egypt. So it's I want to... Yeah. I want to present more about my culture to mm -hmm. um, the other uh, readers who can uh, learn from it, uh, learn about it from my books. Okay, so I think that brings us up to um, six o'clock here, seven, eight, <laughs> different times in different places. <laughs> I want to thank everyone. I want to thank all the audience members. I want to thank our three authors for a wonderful hour. We wish you the best of luck getting translated more and more and more and um, writing more. And I know that some of you also are carrying out the role to encourage younger authors to get into the field. So thank you all very much. And thank you to our audience. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, thank you for hosting us. Thank, thank you, Tabrid so Ahmad. Bye-bye.
I enjoyed Thank my you. time here. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Ahmed. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everyone.